Welcome, everyone. This is the inaugural Tier 1 intro. We wanted to take the time to speak with the Hedgeye community and introduce the team from Tier 1. You guys have obviously met me in my discussions with Keith over the years. Mike Green with Simplify Asset Management. I'm an advisor to Tier 1 and participate on the board. Um, part of the reason that we're bringing Tier 1 and why Tier 1 has become so important or the work that is being done at Tier 1 is so important is because it allows me to actually create the information that I want to look at on a daily basis. And it, I need ultimately a team behind that in order to produce the data, create the information, et cetera. We've done this largely behind the scenes, offering a service that's been available for free as we build this out. And now we're excited to bring it into the Hedgeye community, freeing up additional resources for it. The unfortunate transition, of course, to being paid creates an opportunity for the rest of the team to actually start benefiting from it so that we can build and expand on the fantastic tools that we've already put in place. But I wanted to take a moment to introduce the rest of the team who you may not have met. Some of you met them at the Connecticut conference. First, I wanted to introduce Craig. Craig is the president and COO. Craig is ex-military, absolutely gifted mathematician, incredibly talented programmer, and the guy that I turn to when I'm like, hey, can you recreate this? And typically the answer is yes, it'll take me about 15 minutes on top of everything else that I'm doing. Craig, why don't you give a little bit richer background to yourself? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, so my name's Craig and I'm the CEO of Tier 1 Alpha. Um, so we started Tier 1 Alpha a couple of years ago with the idea that market dynamics have shifted away from sort of this fundamental analysis um, into this more mechanical buying and selling that's happening within uh, the framework of this inelastic market. So we teamed up with Michael Green um, about two years ago now, and we've been focusing on a lot of these research. We found that we had a lot of things in common as far as what we were looking at in the markets. Um, and over that time, we've been building out uh, all of these models to get a really clear um, grasp on what's happening in the institutional space and how those flows are driving uh, the equity markets. Well, and I, and I want to just take a second there because Craig hit on a really important point. The idea here is not to bury people in technical jargon or to try to create information that can't be used. It's Part of it is really education, understanding that so much of what's happening in markets is truly mechanical in nature. It's built on theories and frameworks that have been in place for a very long time. You've obviously heard me talk about passive, for example. You've heard many others talk about the option market dynamic. And so what Craig is, is highlighting here is this mechanical impact in markets that often leads us to say, who in the world could possibly be doing this? Now, speaking of who in the world could possibly be doing this, we got David Pegler with us. David is primarily known for his work in FX, but perhaps you could give us a little bit more of an introduction there as well. Yeah, certainly. So uh, originally from South Africa, that's why I talk a little bit funny now on the East Coast of America. After um, a period in the United States Army and a few combat deployments, I um, got back and decided I cannot run around um, foreign countries anymore. So I got into trading and I've been in the FX market about 18 years and I lost two, three years. Craig and I have combined uh, to get into more of the systematic flows uh, research. And it's been an interesting journey. Fantastic. All right. Well, listen, let's go straight in and start talking about some of the stuff that people can expect to see in a tier one report, why it's there. The focus here is really going to be on education, trying to help people understand some of the materials that we put out why we think they're particularly important, and why you may have heard other people talk about this. Like, I, I'm just going to lay this out there. Some of the first systematic research that I saw around this stuff was the early work of Charlie McGilligot or Mar uh, Marco Kalanovic at JP Morgan, Charlie McGilligot at Namira. Um, a lot of this work really came onto the scene a couple of years ago, highlighting the dynamics of you know, what we call flows. And that's probably a great place to start. Craig, why don't you flip on to the first chart and let's start talking about what flows actually mean. So flows are basically just describing the buying and selling that's happening within the stock market. Um, so you can think of capital flows as every time you buy a stock, you're injecting money into the market. And every time you sell one, you're pulling it out. So there's, there's generally two types of uh, flows that are driving the equity markets, and that's discretionary flows and systematic flows. 
And discretionary flows are um, based on like the personal assessment of individual investors. So if Apple comes out with earnings and you think those earnings are going to be bullish for Apple, you buy Apple uh, and you create a flow in, in those transactions. So the other kind of flow is systematic flows, which where uh, a bulk of our research is focused on. And systematic flows track um, kind of machine driven buying and selling based on uh, systematic strategies that are rules based and often driven by computers uh, and quants. So the easiest way to think about flows and how this is different than the traditional model, and it certainly is something that has taken me you know, down a path that is very, very different. A flow literally just means a transaction that's occurring between any two individual participants in the market. It can be a value investor deciding that a stock has gotten too expensive and deciding to sell it. That means somebody else has to show up to buy it. That transaction has historically been largely ignored in the analysis of financial markets because it was presumed that markets were informationally efficient. In other words, they were very focused on the idea that the flow of information caused a thoughtful reevaluation of the individual fundamentals of each individual company. And as you guys have probably noticed, nobody really talks about that anymore, right? We talk about what the S&P did or what the NASDAQ did or what the Magnificent Seven are doing. Nobody is really sitting there saying, well, you know, when an NVIDIA reported these earnings, this is what I saw on the earnings line that really captured my attention and caused me to transact. The simple reality is, is that people are being forced into these participation, whether it is because of a quantitative type model or whether it is because they're in an industry group as a manager, but as you guys know, and you've heard me talk about over and over again, there's fewer and fewer active managers. I'm a dinosaur in that world, for example. There's more and more systematic strategies that basically treat the market as if it is there to deliver a certain return based on some factor component. So one of those factors that we talk an awful lot about, Craig, is volatility itself. How does volatility affect flows? So when we talk about these quant funds, um, what we're really looking at is things like volatility control funds, which are in the insurance space. Uh, we talk about CTA funds, which is a commodity trading advisor, uh, the trend followers. And then we also look at funds um, that employ a risk parity strategy. So what all of these three strategies have in common is volatility. They are all volatility based. And what I mean by that is they decide their risk allocation and position sizing based on how volatile uh, certain assets are. So can you give me a really simple example of why somebody would choose to do this? Sure, so we could look at vol control funds um, specifically, and we'll, we'll dig into some of our models in a little bit later in this presentation, but uh, a vol control fund looks to target a specific level of volatility within the portfolio um, to avoid any significant drawdowns should some big volatility spike or volatility cluster happen, uh, like we saw in 2020 with COVID. So uh, vault control funds in particular are very focused in the insurance space um, to hedge out some risk and get some market exposure through things like variable annuities um, and some term life insurance. And these funds need to have uh, market exposure but they also need to have that equity um, somewhat liquid. So they have to avoid things like a big drawdown if they're going to have to pay out something like a variable annuity. Well, and this would be a, a perfect example of how markets can change themselves, right? And so if I think about the dynamic of why those types of models emerged, it was under this idea of persistence, right? And so we're all familiar with the expression that markets take the elevator up or the escalator up, but the elevator down, right? Or the stairs up, but the, the elevator down. That ironically is something that feels increasingly untrue in this world. And part of the reason is actually the growth of these types of strategies. So if you have strategies that de-risk when markets become increasingly volatile, as things become more uncertain, they can participate in forcing the market down, but once they're out, they aren't actually there panic selling at the bottom, right? And so we tend to see this dynamic of dripping and then a little bit of cascade. And then once they're done selling, they're out, right? And so that introduces a second dynamic that I think is something that has meaningfully changed in the understanding of markets. And Craig, you've got a really good slide 
uh, articulating this. This is a word, you know, this will be our, our $64,000 word for the day, inelastic, right? So what does inelastic mean in the context of markets, David? Well, it's just a case of, um, it's a case of there's little to no price discovery from these systematic funds anymore. They, I think one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest sort of trading upgrades that we've had over the last 10 years is figuring out what people have to do and what they don't have to do at different times according to volatility. And this inelasticity is exactly that. It's them forcing themselves to get out of the market or get into the market on a rules-based um, sort of system. So and that's how I see the inelasticity. Yeah. Okay. So, so I mean, the, the economic definition of inelastic is the change in is a large change in price for a small change in supply and demand. Right. And, and an elastic market is one that has very little price sensitivity. The models that I grew up with, and I'm, again, a dinosaur. But if you go back and you even look at the models that are being taught in business schools today around financial markets, it's presumed that they're highly elastic. In other words, you can change. You can put through a lot of change in flows, and there's not going to be a very meaningful change in the market, right? So supply and demand can change an awful lot before prices change all that much. A really simple example of this is the classic expression: "Well, for every buyer, there's a seller," right? And so the idea is pretty straightforward. Somebody has to show up with demand at the same time that somebody else is showing up with supply, and therefore it's presumed that very little is going to change in price. Well, that's true if the topic is information, right? So any one piece of information that gets reported holds relatively little information content about a long-term discounted cash flow model, right? An earnings report is tiny relative to the longer-term picture for a company like Apple. Occasionally, there's, there's situations where that's not the case. But that's not how the markets work really anymore at all, right? This goes back to the observation that when a, system, when a systematic strategy encounters a sell signal, particularly if it's a truly passive one, that means sell at any price, right? Or it can mean sell at any price. Likewise, if a new stock gets added into an index, for example, as we saw with Tesla in 2020, the answer is buy at any price, right? And so if I go back and I look at the models that I was taught in the 1980s, 1990s, and that are still being taught in business schools today, this whole idea of the efficient market hypothesis was predicated on the idea that no one player had a particularly large impact on the market. That meant that prices and, and the behavior of stocks were highly elastic. The estimate at the time was basically a dollar in would cause roughly a one penny change in market capitalization, right? What it turns out to be is that about a dollar in creates, depending on who you want to listen to and depending on what type of product they're buying, anywhere from three to $17. I've even seen numbers higher than that at this point. The average consensus is somewhere around five bucks. And this is all predicated on brand new academic work that's really only come out in the last three years. You may hear people talk about Gabay and Coygen's, the inelastic market hypothesis, which really underpins that. Just to emphasize this and put it back, put up, put up the chart one more time, you know, these estimates are now 500 times larger than what they were taught and the models that you know we built around things like CAPM and everything else, right? So there has been a very deep fundamental change in our understanding of how financial markets work. The great irony, of course, is that financial markets don't change very fast, right? So all of the systematic flows that we're talking about are having a much larger impact than any would have, anyone would have fully understood when these strategies were designed. And of course, nobody's going to change them because until, as has been quoted to me, until the crisis or the events actually occur, there's no reason to change, right? It, it's just somebody actually saying something. So this is, in our view, one of the key reasons why we keep seeing this behavior that everyone's saying, markets seem crazy. Who would be buying at these price levels? Who would be buying at these valuation levels? Well, the simple answer is it's nobody crazy. It's often somebody taking the advice of the most august investors on the planet, right? Warren Buffett, 
Cliff Asnes, et cetera, all suggest go by index funds, right? Dollar cost average in, just keep participating in the market, right? Stocks win over the long haul for Jeremy Siegel. These are all investors just trying to do what they've been told to do without fully understanding that they're a participant in the system and they're changing the system in the process. Okay, let's um, talk about key sources of flows. One I just mentioned is this idea of 401ks or retirement flows. And there, the key story that has emerged is actually the growth of systematic strategies, target date funds, passive vehicles, et cetera. Let's go to slide four briefly to talk about target date funds. So a target date fund, most of you will have seen something like this in a 401k. These are now the dominant vehicle in 401ks, roughly 85% of every dollar now going into a 401k is actually put into a target date fund. And that's pretty crazy when you stop and think about it because these didn't exist prior to 2003. They didn't become the what's called the qualified default investment alternative for target date funds or for 401ks, meaning the default investment that you're automatically put into if you fail to make your own selections and elections. These became the default vehicles in 2012. And so in my analysis, and certainly the analysis of, of the rest of the team at Tier 1 Alpha and many academics, this has been the big change. It's actually, crazily enough, not the Fed. It's the growth of these types of strategies where this is now the dominant flow. And because 85 cents of each dollar going into things like 401ks is coming in through target date funds, ironically, that means that many asset managers, many active managers, never even get a chance to participate, right? So when we talk about the death of active managers, it's much more about this flow dynamic, this market share story, than it is actually about performance in any meaningful way. Um, but Craig, how could we actually use this information, right? When we've got something like 401k flows or target date funds, what, how do we think about this at tier, at tier one? So we look at 401k flows to kind of track the longer term trends. And, um, you know, just to talk about our 401k model uh, in particular is, you know, we've, we've really broken this down uh, into every detail. We look at demographics, age groups, education, uh, and the average contributions based on all of those factors. And what we have found is that there's just north of $60 billion a month um, being injected into these target date funds, into uh, 401k funds. Um, and a significant amount of that ends up into the equities market. So, um, you know, when we talk about these flows, what we really look at is the link between the economy, employment levels, and the stock market. And we think uh, 401k flows in general and target date funds create that link. So again, just to orient people, depending on what you think in terms of those flow dynamics, when we're talking $60 billion a month or $720 billion a year, First, that's actually a net number, right? So there are withdrawals that are coming from 401ks as well. But when we look at those inflows, almost all of those, actually more than 100%, once we factor in the withdrawals, are going into these passively managed vehicles like target date funds. Ironically, that means that the money that is being taken out, again, these are the boomers who are retiring, even the silent generation or the GI generations, um, if they still remain, they're making withdrawals for the most part. They're firing active managers. And so, you know, theoretically thoughtful individuals who are putting money to work, trying to think about things like the prospects of the individual company are being fired. They're being replaced by vehicles that simply are allocating on the basis of market capitalization. And what Craig is highlighting is this dynamic of understanding these flows and these dynamics requires you thinking about how likely are people to participate in 401ks? What is their income level? How much are they tapping out, right? It's super interesting when a 25 year old gets their first job, but their maximum contribution to a 401k plan, for example, is somewhere gonna be around you know, 10% of their total income if they save at a higher level than most that's going to mean like $5,000 coming in. In contrast, somebody who's 55 years old and is eligible for catch-up 
could theoretically be contributing north of $50,000 a year and so be a significantly more impactful player. One of the things that's been so interesting to actually watch over the past few years is as those who grew up investing in index funds begin to hit things like the catch-up period, we're actually starting to see even more money flow in than you would have otherwise anticipated simply tied to employment dynamics or anything else. That share gain has been really important. And we actually see this in statistics like Vanguard, the average age of Vanguard's customer. When I started talking about this stuff, the average age of Vanguard's customer in 2017 was about 38 years old. Today, it's north of 50, right? And so in a very short period of time, we've actually seen this expand up. We've seen the quantities that people are allocating through these strategies rise. And again, just to actually put a quantitative number on it, that give or take $60 billion worth of buying creates on a five times multiple, you know, roughly $300 billion worth of price appreciation or market cap appreciation. That's almost a percent a month at this point that we're seeing come just from those 401k contributions. Can I can I jump in there for a minute? Sure. Um, and I think this is one of the this is one of the great things about monitoring these flows is one of the things we do at tier one is we do measure and map the macro a lot. And it's the thing we we like to talk about the most, but it actually doesn't necessarily directly impact these flows at all. I mean, we could talk about Dallas Fed all day long. Um, but you know, then the model might be saying something completely different. And it's ultimately anticipating the employment market as it relates to our models. And sometimes we can measure and map macro and it can be deteriorating for six months and has no material impact on what the flows are, which is interesting and also a, a heck of a tool for, yes, it matters, but it also doesn't in this moment or it matters and it matters. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a great point. And actually, um, it also highlights some of the real challenges that you run into when macro data itself becomes unstable. So one of the things that I wrote about this weekend, for example, is the restatements to the employment numbers that occurred with the release of the business dynamics survey just the past couple of days, right? So I can believe they came out on July 26th. Turns out that we actually had negative employment characteristics in the, in the second quarter of 2022. Guess what? Stocks did terribly. I thought they were supposed to be leading indicators. No, it actually turns out that we had experienced some dynamics of negative flow. On the flip side of that, we've seen a recovery to a certain extent in the last couple of quarters that's contributed to the positive numbers alongside all the traditional sentiment indicators, et cetera. But this is a huge component of exactly what David's articulating. We can watch the macro data deteriorate until it manifests itself in the form of either people not being able to contribute to 401ks because they lost their job or because they're starting to rotate out of equities into fixed income as we're beginning to anticipate as the baby boomers age, as the, as the Gen Xers age, those target date funds become very predictable components of that type of flow. So this is something we're watching very closely. It also speaks, by the way, to one of my key fears, because when recessions hit, it tends to be those 50 plus year olds that lose their jobs, don't get them back, and never fully recover in the contributions to their 401ks, et cetera. That's gonna be a really interesting dynamic that we haven't actually seen play out in, in this cycle yet. Um, it, it's something I'm watching very carefully and that we're monitoring in terms of our flow characteristics. Okay, um, let's go to uh, Delta hedging. You hear us and others talk all the time about gamma right? Gamma, 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 right? Whether it's a gamma squeeze or it is gamma positioning from dealers. Why do we like the Greek alphabet so much, Craig? Well, when we talk about things like gamma and delta hedging, what we're really talking about is flows being driven from the options market. And, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time focusing on the options market because it is just growing exponentially over the past several years. And now we give the analogy of it's the tail wagging the dog. Um, so we track these because it gives us some insight into how, how option dealers or market makers are positioned 
and how much they're going to have to buy and sell, giving certain changes uh, within the underlying asset, like the S and P five hundred. So let's use a really simple example here, right? When we're thinking about what dealers are trying to do, first, dealers are not standing on the other side of the bet from you with the goal of making money based on you being wrong, right? The dealers are actually focused all around transactions. They wanna capture the bid and the ask spread. The problem with the options market though, is that because there are so many issues and because each issue is somewhat unique, right? Do you buy the Apple, you know, 260 calls or do you buy the Apple 240 calls? Do you buy them in October expiry? Do you buy them in December expiry? Or do you buy them for next Tuesday? Right. These are all different strikes, tenors, et cetera, that are very different than simply saying, hey, I want to buy shares of Apple. And so when you buy in the options market, almost always you're going to be facing a dealer. There's not really going to be somebody on the other side of that trade from you who's trading with the opposite perception that you have. That is different than the traditional stock market. At the same time, the dealers don't want to take that directional risk that's created by being on the opposite side of the trade from you. So they'll go out and hedge their position. Now, a really simple example of this is let's imagine you bought an at the money call in something like Apple, assuming it's relatively short dated, that means that the Delta is gonna be about 50, right? If it goes, you buy a call option and Apple goes up, you benefit. How much does that call option go up or how much is the exposure? Well, that's actually what Delta is telling you. That is the hedge ratio for those Apple shares. And so if the option is currently at the money, typically that'll be a 50 delta. There are some wrinkles around that. But that basically what that means is, is that the dealer now needs to go out and buy back its exposure. So I buy a share, uh, I buy uh, an, a single option contract for 100 options on Apple at 50 delta. A dealer is going to hedge that individual position by buying 50 shares of Apple, 50% times 100 shares. Um, if the price of that option goes up, that option is now in the money and becoming more and more like Apple stock itself. It moves from 50 delta to 75 delta. When that occurs, the option maker is now short Apple. And in that price increase, they have to actually buy shares of Apple as well. So this is part of the reason why this is such a big deal because what we're actually describing is forced behavior in which the option market makers are being forced into price behavior or transactions that feel silly, right? Like who wants to buy more when it's higher? Obviously momentum strategies, but likewise a dealer who is hedging Delta exposure. The reverse can be true on the downside. So when we think about this and the growth of that, that is because of the growth of the option space. This has become a really critical dynamic to explain. It behaves some of the components of intraday persistence, right? Once prices start rising, dealers have to chase. It also explains a lot of the pictures around overall volatility. Because if dealers are in what's called positive gamma, in other words, if the market has net sold them optionality, it typically means that when the market goes higher, they actually get longer. When the market goes lower, they naturally get shorter. Right. So they're actually benefiting from it. But that also means that they need to adjust those delta hedge ratios in the opposite direction that the market goes. So market goes up, dealers sell. That pushes the market back down and lowers the realized levels of volatility. That's a critical feature that we see all the time. So when we talk about dealers being in positive gamma, and again, I apologize, gamma measures the change in delta that hedge ratio for 1% change in price of the underlying. So again, positive gamma, you get longer as the market goes higher. Negative gamma, then you get shorter as the market goes, uh, I'm sorry, negative gamma, you get shorter as the market goes higher, right? So that actually means you'd need to buy more shares of Apple as the market went higher, forcing the market to chase Apple higher, right? That's why positive gamma conditions create lower volatility. Negative gamma positions create higher volatility, or at least the potential for them. And we really have not, I mean, David and I talk about this all the time, but we really have not seen high volatility episodes emerge unless dealers are in negative gamma positions, right? It creates a feedback loop 
that can cause the market to feed on itself. We've witnessed the opposite of that basically in all of 2023, right? The market by and large has been in a largely positive gamma environment. So lots of things that we would traditionally think of, certainly if we were in 2022, would have felt catastrophic, right? The failure of Silicon Valley Bank, um, you know, Japan needing to change its interest rate policy. These have all been things that you would have thought could have caused significant volatility events and just have failed to, right? Because the market is, again, being somewhat driven by this tail wagging the dog phenomenon. Okay, um, let's go to um, slide number seven. This is actually the signature chart for tier one. It's the picture that you see on many of our uh, uh, many of our logos and introductions. And it is this issue of what we call positive gamma or negative gamma, looking at the exposure of the dealers in the options market. Craig, could you walk us through how to read this chart? Yeah, sure. So what this chart is basically showing is how much um, hedging flows are going to be generated per one point change in uh, the S&P 500. So we've actually combined uh, SPX and SPY to give a bit bigger picture of the landscape here. But um, so you can see right now that the uh, flow per index point is at around $444 million per one point change in the underlying, which is SPX. So um, you could look at this also as in like a 1% move, in which case a 1% move would trigger about $20 billion in hedging flows. And again, um, you know, when we're in a positive gamma regime, that means that these dealers are going to be selling into that strength and buying into the weakness, which causes markets to um, mean revert. And it's a lot of the things that we uh, see intraday, like Mike was mentioning, when we have some bad news event come in, well, why didn't the market react to that? And if dealers are in positive gamma, it's because these dealer flows were able to stabilize some of that volatility. So that actually is a perfect opportunity to go to slide eight, which illustrates this dynamic of the volatility regimes based on dealer gamma exposure. So... Um, Craig, could you maybe talk through what these two slides are showing us? Yeah, so both of these slides are showing um, just in, in semi different ways, but both of them are showing that there's a clear difference in price action and volatility, depending on how dealers are positioned. Um, so the first chart where you see these two curves on it, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the when dealers are in positive gamma, you can see that the distribution of returns is much tighter versus when dealers are in negative gamma, and you see, tend to see these fatter tails as volatility is increasing. Um, and then the, the second chart on here shows the five-day realized volatility, which again, volatility ends up driving a lot of these um, systematic and institutional quantitative funds. Um, and you can see that when real or when dealers are in negative gamma in the red there, we tend to see a higher realized volatility, which kind of leads us into um, the second half of our discussion. So if, if I think about um, how important that negative gamma positioning is, right, does it mean that the market is going to crash? Should we interpret that as volatility is going to hit us immediately? David, how do you think about that? Um, I don't think of it in those terms necessarily. I think it just means that we're going to experience a higher volatility environment. And that can actually work both ways. And we're not profiling in, in this discussion, but this is where our probable vol bands come in, is that we will see a widening of the general market activity. And yes, the market is more fertile for a precipitous drop in a negative gamma environment, but it's not necessarily uh, it's not necessarily a predictor of a massive drop. It goes both ways. So um, as David mentioned, we didn't actually go through that chart today. We didn't include that in the package, although that's definitely one that we'll introduce in the future. But let me see if there's, um, if you look at slide 10. So part of the way we think about 
these two components. Gamma exposure is almost like a throttle for volatility. High positive gamma from dealers means they trade against the market direction, suppressing volatility. While volatility itself then acts as a trigger for equity exposure, meaning lower volatility, all else equal is going to lead people to ramp up their exposure to equities. They're perceived as less risky. Now, that all feels very crazy until you start thinking about things like mechanical flows that are tied to things like insurance company operations, et cetera, and are forced to ultimately manage their risk in this sort of rear view mirror fashion, right? So we're, we're absolutely looking at this dynamic and the chart that I wanted you guys to focus on here on the right-hand side, this is looking at the dealer exposure by gamma regime. Now, some of this is purely mechanical, right? Because when people hedge, they buy downside volatility. That means the dealers are often going to be pressured into a negative gamma position because you're net buying the options rather than selling the options. Whereas during bull market environments, things just naturally result in lower volatility. Volatility lowering itself means there's a smaller range of possible outcomes, which reduces hedge ratios, et cetera. And so we tend to get this. Now, I just want to emphasize that you can have some of the most violent gains, and David was just alluding to this, during periods of negative dealer gamma, right? All it's telling you is there's going to be a higher probability of volatility-related events. Um, if we keep going through and then talk about the dynamics of volatility as a trigger, now let's talk in some detail about these volatility-controlled funds. Craig, can you talk through slide 11? Yeah, absolutely. So we spoke about uh, vol control funds um, a little bit earlier in this video, but, um, you know, and just just to um, kind of recap, a, a really important point to make is when dealers are in either negative or positive gamma, that doesn't necessarily add some sort of directional component to the market. All it means is volatility is going to be uh, increasing, and it, it doesn't even have to increase. It just increases the the probability that we're going to see higher volatility. Um, but again, it doesn't add a directional component. It doesn't create a trend. So when we look at gamma exposure uh, as a throttle for volatility, we look at volatility as the toggle for equity exposure, and that's really what we're trying to capture within our vol control model here. So. Um, again, you know, vol, vol control funds or risk targeting funds are generally um, in the insurance space. They're, they're a very popular strategy in the insurance space. And it's to mitigate some of these risks from a, a major drawdown. So vol control funds typically follow either like a, a vol target, which means, um, you know, how, how much volatility they want their strategy or their portfolio to have. And they usually set it at between 5% for a, a very low volatility portfolio. 10% um, or 15% if they're willing to take on a little bit more risk. And what's uh, really important about these strategies is they use something called volatility scaling, which uses realized volatility as a toggle for equity exposure. So as realized volatility rises, uh, these quant funds, these vol control funds are going to sell their equity exposure. And when realized volatility decreases, they're going to be buying back um, they're going to be buying back equities. They're going to be adding risk to their portfolios. And again, you know, within a framework of an inelastic market where there's these constrained uh, supply and demand dynamics, these flows really have a large impact, um, typically with some sort of multiplier effect versus, um, you know, what, whatever notional amount that we're going to be able to track. So I, I would just emphasize that when we start thinking about this type of dynamic, these types of exposures, um, you know, this seems a little crazy until you recognize that it's basically the same thing as like targeting a moving average crossover, right? So on a price-based dynamic, we're all familiar with the language. If stocks are above a 50-day moving average or a 200-day moving average, that's bullish. If stocks are below a 50-day moving average or a 200-day moving average, that's bearish. Or if the 50 crosses over the 200, et cetera, right? We're all familiar with those types of dynamics. This is doing the exact same thing within the volatility space. And it actually is an outgrowth of one of the biggest risks that you have when you're doing a trend following strategy, 
is that the market actually becomes highly low or becomes very low volatility. And as a result, you're constantly being whipped around by 50 and 200 day crosses, right? So a very low volatility market will almost by definition be crossing over and under its 50 day moving average or its 200 day moving average repeatedly over the course of that time period. It's just not moving all that much. As a result, it can shake you out of positioning. Volatility control strategies were designed to help deal with that same dynamic, lowering the overall transaction frequency. And then as Craig was pointing out, part of the reason why we pay attention to these is it's not as simple as saying, well, what is the crossover? Where did it hit this level? It becomes a continuous increase in exposure or decrease in exposure. And so one of the things that we focus on is this idea of what is the overall positioning in the market? If I go back to September 22, for example, 2022, and I look at the positioning of vol control funds, how did that stack up, Craig? Well, uh, you know, exposure was a lot lower because we were seeing more volatility. And as I mentioned, you know, as realized volatility climbs, uh, vol control funds end up selling off their risk. Um, so since then, since about, um, you know, October of 2022, volatility has started to come back lower. And we're seeing that now with realized vol, um, you know, both a one month look back and a three month look back, and even the VIX um, sitting at these 52 week lows. So as volatility has decayed over that time period, it's caused these funds to build up exposure over time. Um, and in fact, I think now it's just year to date, we've seen um, vault control funds add about $120 billion of equity exposure, which means all of that cash, all of those flows have gone into the market and helped support this year to date rally that we've had. So that's a really important point, though, and it's, it's why I wanted to hit on it. When we think about the impact of these types of mechanical flows, one of the great things is, is when exposure, in other words, positioning gets really low as it did in September, October of last year, well, how much selling can they actually do? They can't really sell anymore. Likewise, if we go back and we look at early 2020 or even late 2021, there were elements of exposure that were dramatically higher. 2021 is not a great example because volatility itself remained relatively elevated. But certainly going into spring 2018, certainly going into January, February 2020, we were experiencing high levels of exposure for these types of strategies, suggesting that unless they attracted new capital, unless new money flowed into these types of strategies, they were largely tapped out as a buyer. That neutralizes them in their positioning. And as Craig was pointing out, right now, we're, we would guess that we're probably about 75% to full allocation across things like volatility targeting strategies. Um, another form, and I just mentioned trend following, is commodity trading advisors. And so, Craig, can you talk to slide 12? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, commodity trading advisors, often called CTA funds, um, are, funds that uh, are, are mostly based in the futures market. And, um, you know, I think they're they're normally um, associated with some sort of trend following, which they obviously do. But what a lot of people miss is how um, important realized volatility is uh, and how these funds allocate, um, you know, their, their asset allocation. So, um, yeah, so let's, let's let David chime in here for a second. David, why, sure. why would, I mean, these are trend following strategies. Why do I care about volatility? Um, I mean, simply put, if volatility rises, there's likely to be a deleveraging from these CTAs. And that is something that we can track and then quantify and obviously react to ourselves in our own yeah. portfolios. Yeah, so David is hitting on kind of the key component here, right, which is part of the validity of a trend, how comfortable I am that the trend is true, is to look at how much of the price behavior is explained by the trend itself, right? So if I have a high degree of volatility, well, yeah, the trend can tell me I'm going up, but it actually can't explain that much of the price movements. Therefore, I have to take a smaller position than I otherwise might, even in something like a trend following strategy. 
So it takes us right back to that same underlying dynamic. Again, volatility becomes almost a directional component because lower volatility mechanically leads to inflows, which in turn pushes stock prices or security prices up. Um, Craig, how, how big are these flows? What do we think there? Um, well, on a on a daily basis, and you know that that's actually an important point, Mike. Is um, you know with commodity trading advisors and vol control funds, they tend to rebalance on these very short term dynamic windows. So when we think of um, a more traditional like sixty forty portfolio, uh, a lot of times that they're going to be rebalancing either quarterly or monthly. In which case, um, positions can kind of get out of whack. Asset allocation can get out of whack in the meantime. But with CTA funds and vol control funds. Um, they're typically rebalancing either daily or weekly um, to try and always maintain whatever their their core strategy is. So as far as commodity trading advisors, um, you know, we've done a lot of research into this and we estimate there's about $300 billion tied to CTA funds. Um, and that is before any leverage is put on. So there's a significant amount of capital that is tied to these funds. So I think that's actually an important component because many people have heard me talk about passive and, you know, the world's largest passive fund itself is well north of a trillion dollars in assets. But you're hitting on a really important point when you say that the CTAs move very fast. In other words, they can whip around that 250 to 300 billion dollars and change from long to short in relatively short period, relatively brief periods of time. Right. Whereas a trillion dollar plus index based mutual fund, barring massive redemptions, which would be a surprise, is really not going to ever transact in that big of a volume. It's more like a continuous Chinese water torture where it just gets drip, 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 drip in terms of the impact on the market. We follow the CTAs, the vol control funds, et cetera, hedge fund positioning, because they tend to move much faster. Right. And so while there's that continuous influence of things like passive target date funds, et cetera, we have to be very aware that those amplify the behaviors of these fast moving market participants rather than completely replace them. Um, if we and actually on, on that slide, slide 12, I just want to emphasize like the, the, the penultimate phrase to remember here is higher equity volatility reduces exposure, triggering selling flows. Lower equity volatility leads to increased exposure, generating buying flows. This is part of the reason why historically it has been perceived as profitable, and there's some truth to this, that what you are looking for is a contrarian opportunity. High volatility likely leads to buying opportunities. Why? Because exposure has been reduced around that much higher volatility that exposure is likely to come back in as volatility retreats. We call that, in hindsight, a buying opportunity. Likewise, the reverse is true. When everything looks absolutely perfect and all the realized volatility is really, really low and everybody is highly confident that they're going to have a job forever, et cetera, ironically, that creates an everyone in the pool sort of moment where you know the next step is somebody getting out, right? And so these actually help to explain those behavioral components that most have effectively treated as, well, people be crazy, right? Like, we don't think that at all. We actually think that people tend to follow rules and heuristics and behavior that is predetermined by kind of where they sit, what their objectives are, who they're trying, what they're trying to accomplish with their market exposure, et cetera. And that can give the illusion that people be crazy but they're often pretty smart, right? People are not dumb. If you're approaching this game from the standpoint that people are dumb, I can guarantee you, you're gonna lose and you'll come off like a dick, so don't do it. Um, okay, let's go on to the next one. Uh, risk parity funds, this is slide 13. Craig, chime in here and, and, and explain what you mean by risk parity, what we mean by risk parity, and how this is yet another source of flows that can impact markets. Yeah, so risk parity funds, um, and when you think of risk parity, you could think of things like um, Bridgewater and their all-weather portfolio, you know, made famous by Ray Dalio. And basically what this means is asset allocation is decided based on the volatility of the asset, 
rather than some predetermined ratio like a 60-40 portfolio. Um, so this ties in with realized volatility the same way as the other funds do. The higher the volatility, the less exposure each asset has. Um, and that's that's kind of the, the core concept um, and what brings all of these three strategies that we've mentioned today together is realized volatility. Volatility uh, as, it, as it increases drives selling flows and as volatility decreases, it drives these buying flows. And of course, this is all driven by um, volatility from the options market, from these dealer gamma hedging flows that we see. So again, I just want to emphasize to people, note the repeated refrain, lower volatility creates buying, higher volatility creates selling. Why? Because rules-based systems are reinforcing these dynamics. That's really all we're trying to do is to give ourselves and you a picture of what these things look like, whether it's coming from the options hedging market or whether it's coming from these systematic flows that increasingly dominate the investment universe. Okay, um, only a couple more to go and it feels like we are right there. So I wanted to hit, before we move on to how we combine all these together, I want to hit on a couple of wrinkles around things like commodity trading advisors or risk parity funds and different ways that you can approach these things. So Craig, one of the discussions that you and I have on a pretty regular basis is this issue of, you know, our models will occasionally suggest that CTAs or risk parity funds are actually buying equities while others are selling or selling while others might suggest that they're buying. And one of the reasons why that's the case is because these assets have to consider trends in the case of commodity trading advisors or risk in the case of risk parity relative to other assets. And so there's two ways that you can run these models. You can run them independently. Are, is equity vol high or low? Or a second way to approach it is equity vol high or low relative to other types of volatility, right? That can change the dynamics quite substantially. And so we actually monitor both to try to make sure that we understand whether things are unattractive simply because somebody who trades equities based on either trend following or um, uh, volatility control type dynamics, whether they're adjusting their position on an equity only basis. But then we'll also look at it in pure in true cross asset models that evaluate all of them together. And that's actually one of the things that, that we think is kind of interesting right now is if I look at single factor, in other words, if I just look at equity volatility, it suggests that there's an awful lot of buying going on. But Craig, what happens if I look at it across multiple asset classes? Well, yeah, I mean, exactly as you mentioned, uh, you know, these these strategies are not run just for equities. They're always run within a broader strategy looking at, um, you know, commodities, FX rates and everything else. So uh, sometimes exposure has nothing to do with equities at all. Um, those buying and selling flows, it has to do with some other portion of the market that's driving, um, you know, a, a different allocation of funds. And then it appears like CTAs are going to be selling because volatility is going up or down. But really, it could be be because, um, you know, something happened in the bond market, which changed the allocation of the whole portfolio. And again, this speaks to a phenomenon that we see, which is volatility in one market can perversely create buying or selling in another market, right? So we see this all the time. Bond markets sell off good or bad for equities? We often don't know, right? It really depends on all types of other factors and positioning. And if you're not thoroughly confused yet, you will be, I promise. Um, so when, we, think when, we, when we think about this and we try to combine it, we create what we call a systemic positioning index, but I'm gonna let David go first here, David. Well, I, I was just saying to your point earlier, Mike, is, and that's largely what we saw um, at the end of 2020, 2021, after the COVID recovery, was there was more institutional buying in the crypto space. And yep. then, you know, something that might have been a one, two, three percent allocation, the volatility of Bitcoin went stratospheric and it disrupted the volatility of the entire portfolio. And as a result, you got to cut out the cancer. 
And then that creates buying and selling in other assets, which in turn move their volatility. So a lot of times that cross asset volatility is really important and can move other things around. And, and and we don't have slides that speak directly to this in this discussion, but also correlations become an issue, right? So when Bitcoin right. is the you know greatest investment of all time and it's uncorrelated uncorrelated with other assets, well, that actually perversely can allow me to expand my total portfolio. But when something becomes correlated with other assets, right, becoming positively correlated, then adding it to my portfolio actually increases risk as compared to reducing risk through the diversification benefits. And so all of this stuff becomes really important to follow as these systematic flows, these option hedging flows become larger and larger parts of the market. And again, just to emphasize, not everything is happening here. There's lots of reasons why people will buy stocks individually. Often it can boil down to as simple as, I received new inflows as an active manager, therefore I have to buy, or I received outflows as an active manager, I have to buy. We're not suggesting that the only thing that happens in markets are these, system these systematic flows, but they do provide the backdrop under which you want to evaluate the behavior of the next thing that happens. Right, and that's really what we're trying to accomplish. All of this comes together in the last chart or starts to come together. And this is increasingly the area that we're very focused on is combining across these flows to build a more holistic picture. Our, system our systematic positioning index is actually adding up these individual pieces and trying to evaluate the size of these impacts. Craig, can you talk a little bit about slide 14, which is the last slide in our pack? Sure, absolutely. Um, so as Mike mentioned, uh, we we ended up finding a need to combine the equity exposure from vault control, CTA funds, and risk parity because uh, occasionally they'll be doing different things. For instance, um, just last week, we saw vault control funds selling while CTA funds were adding exposure. And to a certain degree, uh, those flows are going to cancel each other out. So we start while we do obviously track these flows individually, um, we have found a lot of benefit in combining them to get a, a broader picture of overall buying and selling that's happening. So um, as Mike mentioned, this is our, our systematic positioning index. And um, combined, when we look at risk parity, vault control, and CTA, we estimate that there's about a trillion dollars of assets under management within all of these strategies. And when these funds, these mechanical quantitative funds all start buying in the same directions, they can have just massive impacts on the underlying index and create, um, you know, these huge disparities between whatever the, the economic picture is at the time and what the equity markets is doing. So if you notice on this chart, you'll actually see last uh, in 2022, we hit basically a, a full standard deviation below normal in terms of exposure as markets effectively absorbed that selling behavior. And, and in 2020, we were significantly worse, but as markets absorbed that selling behavior in 2022, they sold off. Once things had worked themselves through the system, they began buying. And that is where it actually becomes really powerful. So if we start adding in then the target date funds, the 401k contributions, et cetera, we're now talking a couple trillion dollars worth of flows, driving markets, helping to explain the extraordinary rebound that we've seen. This is really what we're trying to accomplish within tier one. Now, I'll tell you candidly that we don't get it right all the time. Sometimes our biases intrude. Sometimes our macro perspective, we can't avoid the bad habits of saying, here's something you need to be aware of or how we could see things change. But we will always be presenting the facts behind this stuff and hopefully creating conditions under which you can form your own opinion and conclu conclusions around these while putting some entertaining text and some lighthearted humor and some jokes in there to make it a very readable piece on a daily basis. Um, with that, I think we can wrap up. Guys, this was fantastic. I really enjoyed the opportunity to introduce you to the rest of the world. And I'm looking, looking forward to making these types of features a regular component of Hedge Eye programming. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it.